Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Rob Haas, and with me here is Team 3747, The Hive, from Sandy, Utah. They've had a couple of qualifiers throughout the season. They recently ended as the Winning Alliance Captain and Control Award recipient at their qualifier in late February, and now they're gearing up for the Utah State Championship coming up in mid-March. They have a fantastic role with the season, tons to dive into, and I can't wait to talk to The Hive coming up on Behind the Box. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay guys, so let's get started talking about your robot. I think the first thing that jumps out to me is really the sleek, uh, you know, outer casing or of, of the entire drivetrain. Why don't you walk me through the material behind that? It doesn't look like aluminum, but I could be wrong. Um, so yeah, please tell us about that. Yeah, so for the outside, it's gonna be, we have this polycarbonate here that we made by ourselves. So it's really useful. It makes the whole robot just look sleek and nice. It prevents, it helps our protect our wiring, which is over here, mm -hmm. from other robots and other interferences there. Uh, also helps prevent pixels from getting underneath the robot. So everything goes smoothly there. And it's just been really great in uh, giving good form of the robot. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of questions there, because I think there's really a ton of potential for teams to learn from here. Uh, first, is it one singular piece or like two singular pieces around the entire thing, or how many broken up components is it? So it's two singular pieces. Yeah, so it's two singular pieces around the robot. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, bent the, we bent the pieces so that it forms to the shape of the robot that, it, that it's on, mm -hmm. so that it kind of forms to whatever shape it's on. Yeah, so, no, that, that that's really awesome. And so with that, are you guys modeling uh, like the bends themselves in a CAD software or is it more freehand? Yes, it is in CAD, we use uh, Fusion 360. So okay. we model all the bends and all the places where there are holes and all the places. So then we could just cat, uh, make it ourselves. Yeah, so no, that, that's really impressive. And as far as like the manufacturing for that goes, then do you, is it just kind of like a heat gun, making sure you have a flat surface or do you have like a more robust industrial uh, type setup? Yeah, so we first, this, this one was made with a heat gun making all the bends and also cutting with a saw. And this week, we also have a new ply carbon that we outsourced with a company that we hope to get on because there's a, it's not clean in some areas, so we're hoping to get uh, we'll reach out to the professionals to get that done. So. Yeah, no, that, that that's really cool. You know, I mean, it seems like such a simple part of the robot, but there's really like, you know, if teams were able to implement this, it would really, I think, level up their game. And especially from a robustness perspective, you know, polycarbonate is very tough and will, you know, make sure your robot doesn't uh, break and can withstand the defense you'll see in matches. So now getting onto your robot, walk me through the intake, how it works, and then we can jump into some of the finer details. So for our intake, we've actually used uh, a lot of, um, for intake, we uh, took a lot of like parts from previous years. So mm -hmm. first we have this, uh, we have mandibles that we took inspiration from uh, quality control. So what that does is it allows us to pick up from pixel stacks and allows us to pick up a lot easier uh, from the wings. And then we have rubber band sprockets right here to push it up. And there's actually three components right here that are all powered by one motor. And the, the first one is this, you, I don't know if you can see, it's a little rubber roller down there. And that's to uh, flick the yeah. pixels up into the tray. And then there's some rubber compliance wheels right here. Those are made uh, so that if a pixel gets stuck or flings in the wrong area, it will uh, keep it down and push it back up. Mm -hmm. A lot of our robot is anatomical. So um, like I said, we call these the mandibles. Uh, this little flipper inside is the tongue and it has a sensor that detects when a pixel comes in and it flicks the pixels up into the tray. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the tongue is definitely very, very interesting. I feel like we haven't seen a lot of teams do that. You know, usually they'll just go for 
no tongue at all and then just transfer straight into uh, the deposit area. So what made you guys decide to have the tongue there? Uh, you know, did you try without it and you just realized it really needed to be there or was it something else? So we went through a lot of different designs with our tray, over a hundred different iterations. Uh, original, like very, very early on in the season designs, we tested with just making the tray shape to where when a pixel comes in, it pushes the pixel inside of it already out. But that was really unreliable, hard to predict. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, we had the ideas for our tongue very early on, but it kind of changed a little bit. First, it was just going to be a bar that flips it back and forth and then when I showed you those rubber compliance wheels those used to be like these uh, rubber kicker looking things that go build the cells uh, and the problem with those is they were flicking them up into the into the back of the robot mm -hmm. getting stuck so by making the tongue this shape it makes it so it can push it actually up without flinging it out of the tray yeah no that 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 makes a ton of sense and uh you know as far as the programming for that is concerned i know you guys mentioned you have the sensor so is it completely automated uh or are there any manual inputs from the drivers um to decide which way the tongue is oriented um so the tongue is by default, it's completely automated, mm -hmm. um, but the driver can use manual controls um, in case of sensor failure or if it's um, you know any uh, sort of failure. Um, yeah, they can take manual control of that. Yeah, that no, that that makes a ton of sense. And so now going on to your transfer and deposit. Once you have the pixels uh, in the tray where you showed us, what comes next? So we wanted to do something a little different, and like I said, we took inspiration from previous years of our team. Um, a lot of teams will do like a linear slide thing to do. We have this arm that has two very high torque motors um, as the shoulders like down here. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another motor, what we call the elbow up here that actually can move the move it around so what actually picks it up is we have these two sets of servos right here and those are the fingers and once the pixels are in place the driver can operate them and they flip out like this and then they'll flick it around and go up to the board and it can place it like that mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And so a couple questions there. Are you guys always placing the pixels at the same angle or like with two rotational degrees of freedom, do you uh, change what angle you drop the pixels off at at all? Um, mainly the same angle. The biggest thing that changes is the different height values for going for different set lines mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but it's mainly the same angle. Mm -hmm. And so with those different heights, uh, when are those all like pre-calibrated? They're just preset, you know, you just press buttons to go to different ones, or do you have some sort of inverse kinematics um, formula to set it correctly at the exact level you want it to be at? Um, so we use inverse kinematics um, and the driver can just move between different heights and it calculates uh, what values the arm and shoulders need to go to mm -hmm. to uh, place at the height we want. Okay. Yeah. No. That that's always it's always impressive to see when teams are able to implement uh, you know math and physics based algorithms uh, like that. So now talking about the control for the arm and kind of the homing, I wasn't sure if I saw any uh, absolute encoders. So is your arm uh, for positioning? Do you use relative encoders or do you use uh, something else entirely? Uh, we use relative encoders. Okay. And uh, we wanted to use mm -hmm. absolute encoders, but um, they've been unavailable. We haven't been able to get any, unfortunately. I see. So those relative encoders are just the motor encoders, and then you make sure you start the arm in the same location every time at the beginning of the match, or do you have like a limit switch for homing or anything? Um, we just base it off the starting position at the start, so we make sure um, that the uh, uh, arm is pressed all the way down uh, in the start position so that it always starts in the same place. I see. I see. That that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So now going on to your end game, you know, you mentioned that you have those two very high torque motors uh, for the arm. Are you also using those to hang your robot or is it a different mechanism? Yeah. So that's kind of a, one unique thing about our robot is that we use the high torque motors of the arm to actually hang as well. Mm -hmm. So that's really great. So we don't have to add any other additional mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So we'll demonstrate that here so what we do is we we lift up in, into this position okay move that over and so we just wow like that so both motors just go like that it's super fast takes under 
under two seconds and it's just really efficient and we can do it last second or in both spots and it's been really consistent for us we've yeah we missed a single hang in our competitions yeah no that that's that's really impressive that's uh, honestly yeah pretty pretty awesome always always nice to see when teams have like really really quick hang mechanisms i think it can be very helpful uh in in critical matches and you know going on to your drone now the last part uh as far as scoring goes is anything fancy you guys have going on there or was it really like simple as key to ensure consistency yeah so with the drone definitely went through a lot of iterations it's definitely a pretty unique design mm -hmm. so with the drone we first have the main construction of the drone is that most of the weight is at the front of the drone, as you okay. see here with all the, the interlocking folds. So this makes it so that the front is really heavy, so that it kind of follows more of a parabolic motion, so it's uh, really more predictable, more reliable. Mm -hmm. So then we have the winglets here. Uh, here. So we have the winglets on the robot. On, uh, sorry, on, the, on, the, on the drone here. So what this allows it to do is it really allows the air to push the drone down so it uh, doesn't like go far without these winglets. Mm -hmm. It'll kind of drift from side to side or just keep going straight, which is mm -hmm. not what we want. So they really just try to keep the drone in a nice path. Awesome. Then regarding the drone launcher, so we have two Axon Micros here. Mm -hmm. We have one that uh, holds this little hook here that uh, holds the string and it's attached to these two springs here. Mm -hmm. So this allows the, the drone to launch. We would literally start with rubber bands, but we found that springs don't uh, deform easily, so they were more consistent for us. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you said there's like one more part uh, for the second Axon Micro? Yes, so that is this holder here. If you can see, mm -hmm. it's this metal bar in the, in the center of the drone. So that allows, uh, during teleop, it clamps down on the drone mm -hmm. so that it doesn't move at all. So what that's doing is that when we're bumping into things or we're driving around, it's going to stay in the same position so it uh, makes it more consistent. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Hive, thank you very much. You know, I think there's so many unique and incredible things about your guys' robot. Uh, you know, one last question before we close out is you guys have your Utah State Championship coming up very, very soon, March 16th, March 15th. So as far as plans for that go, do you want to make any changes to your robot? Is it more just like tuning uh, autonomous programs and testing things like that? Um, of course, autonomous is incredibly important for getting high rankings and high scores, so it is mainly going to be tuning autonomous, but we do have a few things that we, we want to try to maybe improve driver quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is we want to attach, uh, see if we can attach LED strips onto the sides of our arms, and what that can tell us is um, uh, we have color sensors in the tray that aren't doing much right now, but our plan for that is so that the color sensors or the color LED strips can light up with the color of the pixels that are in the tray. And another thing that we really wanted is there's a distance sensor we installed on the front of the robot. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things we had at the beginning of the season was de-scoring because our arm has a lot of torque and so it can knock off the pixels. Mm -hmm. So what we're hoping with that distance sensor is that we could have something like, you know, it shines red if you're too close and it's gonna hit the board and then it's green once it's good. And we think that would make it a lot easier and faster for our drivers to score. Yeah, of course. Well, Team 3747, thank you very, very much. I think you guys have a fantastic robot, as I was saying earlier. And I can't wait to see how you guys do at the Utah State Championship. You know, hopefully you're able to get one of those tickets to Houston and we'll see you guys compete again uh, later in April. But in the meantime, thank you very much for this interview. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas, and this is Team 3747, The Hive. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.